I'm Coyote Peterson, and today we're going behind the scenes at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. This morning we made the beautiful drive across the Sonoran Desert to arrive in Tucson Mountain Park, which is home to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. Established in 1952 by William Carr and Arthur Pack, their vision was to create a living museum where visitors could come see animals living in completely natural looking environments. Since childhood I have been visiting this location, enthralled by all of its animal species, and inspired to live a life of adventure and animals. Today I am lucky enough to walk the grounds with Will Bruner, the museum's curator of animal experiences, a job that as a child I could have only dreamed of. The first stop would be the mountain lion exhibit. This elusive desert cat has been an ambassador for the museum since 1952. Wow, look how beautiful that cat is. His mother was killed and he was found as about a four month old cub in California. Obviously too young to survive on his own in the wild and so that's how he came to us here. So this cat weighs about 100 pounds now and will grow to be about 200 pounds. It'll grow to be, uh, yeah, almost 200 almost, pounds. So almost double in size. It's amazing. Even from this distance, you can see how big this cat really is. The great thing about this exhibit is one of our goals is not only to create naturalistic, but also to create interesting environments for mm -hmm. the animals. We vary sometimes feeds. We'll vary with placement of food. So this gives him a lot of choices, and choice is a really important thing to an animal in its environment. And is that kind of why you hide food throughout the enclosure? Exactly. So it forces him to almost have to hunt and search out Exactly. We want him using all of those natural abilities. The ability to track his prey by scent or visual. He can actually work those muscles and as if he were taking down prey. Basically stimulating their environment. Even putting scents in here might cause him to actually go and scent mark, which is another behavior he would do in the mm -hmm. wild. So what's he snacking on there? A little bit of everything. We feed a variety of diets, but sometimes the favorite treats like whole animals, a ground meat product that's specifically made for wild cats in captivity. Believe it or not, one of his absolute favorite treats is cream cheese. On bagels or on ground squirrels? <laughs> yes, a little bit of both. Yeah. He goes, he's going up into his little, little den area there. He says, I have had my snack. Now it's time to take a nap. Everybody. Okay, so Will, I feel like I'm standing right in the middle of the Sonoran Desert right now but we're really just in part of the museum at this point. And it's amazing, I mean, you guys have designed this place to feel like you're actually in the environment. And that's one of the missions of the museum. We want you to really appreciate this area because the Sonoran Desert is uh, like nowhere else in the world. It's a little bit of a microcosm of all the Sonoran Desert habitat here at the museum in a small space. So you can do the whole Sonoran Desert, which would take you months to walk it if you did it. But here at the museum, you can do it in a couple hours. We're a natural history museum as well as a zoo and a botanical garden. All of those roles play a really important part in the museum's mission to educate people about the Sonoran Desert. Wow, cool. All right, well, let's go find some more animals. Great. So right now we're working our way down, and I can see them over there by the side of the fence. Javelinas, this is like one of my favorite animals that lives out here in the Sonoran Desert. What I know of javelinas, Will, is that there are these little powerhouses of muscle and ferocity. And, I mean, I can clearly see, I mean, this guy's no bigger than a golden retriever, but he looks like he's built like a tank. They are, and actually, they're, they're incredibly powerful little animals for their body size. Literally, just uh, the muscles on the head and the neck and the shoulders support that, you know, the large jaws. They work together as a family to defend themselves, to defend their territory as well. Uh, I just saw two of them, they were kind of like rubbing each other's butts on each other's heads. What were they doing there? They actually, that's a social behavior, they have a, a musk gland or a gland on the top of their back. They'll rub as a way of sort of coating everybody in the same scent and that's the way they identify themselves. So it's like a social grooming and a bonding behavior. So what are javelinas typically feeding on out here in the in the desert environment and then do you guys provide them with any sort of food or do they just eat what's naturally here in their habitat? No, we do actually provide them with food. Yeah, and the desert food is often seasonal so the prickly pear fruit which you'll see which they do really like is only around this time of year. They have real tough skin on their noses and snouts, mm -hmm. right? So those little spines, those doesn't bother them at all. Wow, look, go. look at those tusks. Now, do they use those tusks for anything defensive or for eating? What are the they're, those are, of these they're, they're defensive. They're okay. basically used in any social altercations and also for defense. Uh, and those tusks are actually amazing. They, the way they line up in the in the javelina's mouth is that as they move back and forth, even with an open and closing their mouth, they're constantly sharpening those tusks. Oh, wow. We're going to take a shortcut, one of the perks of being behind the scenes at the Desert Museum, on our way to go see the bighorn sheep. Now this is a very important part of the conservation work that you guys are doing here. Tell us all about these sheep. Well these are desert bighorn and they are native to the area, but we're also part of a captive breeding program with this species. We just recently received uh, a female from the Los Angeles Zoo. She had a, a lamb about six months ago, which continues our 
uh, breeding program, but also both her and her mother are unrelated to our male, which means they can continue that captive breeding program here at the museum. And this is the lamb right here, right? Yep, this is the youngster, uh, and she's uh, done amazingly well. When I think bighorns, I always think of that famous opening scene for Marty Stauffer's Wild America. We have the two males just boom, crushing heads with each other. In the wild, they would break into male and female groups outside the breeding season, and within the male groups, they would start jousting and basically establishing who was going to be the dominant animal to breed. So what then is the ultimate goal of this species survival plan? It's to maintain a genetically diverse population within a captive setting, but not only for exhibitry and zoological institutions, but also in the event of a population crash in a wild population. There is so much to experience at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum and more animal and plant species than we could ever pack into a single episode of Breaking Trail. From rescue animals to species survival plans, Arthur Pack and William Carr's original vision of a living museum has truly grown into one of the world's most renowned natural history and zoological establishments. Will, I can't thank you enough for taking the crew and I out here today. Truly a once in a lifetime experience to get behind the scenes and see all the amazing conservation and education work you guys are doing here. I had a fantastic time. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave, stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. If you thought that was one wild adventure, check out these other animal encounters. And don't forget, subscribe to follow me and the crew on this season of Breaking Trail. This episode of Breaking Trail was brought to you by the Buy Power Card from Capital One. Every purchase brings you closer to a new Chevrolet, Buick, GMC, or Cadillac vehicle.